Thank you for meeting with me. If this is your first visit to the Bellflower Casino Resort, I hope you're finding it a pleasant one. I've owned this place for over 30 years. Running the Bellflower has been my life's work, a life which is almost over. I have terminal cancer, and I've been fighting it for years, but my time is coming to an end. I've already come to terms with my condition, but it leaves me with a problem. I never found time to start a family, and I don't have any close friends. This hotel is all I have to leave to this world. It's my legacy, but I have no one to carry on that legacy once I'm gone. I need you to help me decide on the best person to inherit the Bellflower. I've made a list of four candidates, each of whom has a strong connection to this hotel. Unfortunately, I, I don't know any of them very well. I've invited them all here for the weekend under the guise that you want to do an interview with them for a book that you're writing about the hotel. Now, they're being paid a healthy stipend for their time, so you'll likely find them willing to answer any questions you may have. I want you to learn everything you can about them and report back to me if you discover anything relevant. Their names are Ashley, Mallory, Sarah, and the last one is a couple of newlyweds named Todd and Becca. Ashley is a magician. She's been holding her magic show here at the Bellflower since we added a theater during our last renovation. She's been here longer than any employee and she's as financially tied to this place as anybody, aside from myself. She's a private person, so I don't know much about her personal life. Mallory is the unluckiest person I've ever met. She's also one of the nicest. I've never seen so much tragedy befall such an undeserving person. I unfairly gave her a hard time when we first met, but we get along well now. I gave her a complimentary stay here at the hotel to apologize, and she wouldn't stop talking about how much she loved it here. I think she might even like my hotel more than I do. Like the others on my list, I, I don't know very much about her. Sarah is the daughter of the Goodley family. She's been staying here with her parents on family vacations for years. That family is so wholesome that they make the Brady Bunch seem edgy. They're a welcome breath of fresh air here in Las Vegas, and I love the idea of someone with very strong moral values like Sarah taking over the hotel. I barely know anything about those two. Their names are Becca and Todd. I met them today when they were checking in. They came to Las Vegas to get married, and this trip is also doubling as their honeymoon. Yeah, I know it must seem odd to consider leaving my estate to a couple I barely know, but honestly, I barely know any of the people I'm considering. I figure that if they're staying here for their wedding and their honeymoon, then they're going to have a very strong emotional connection to the Bellflower Hotel. Plus, it almost seems like fate that they happen to check in today while I'm trying to make this decision. I'm counting on you to ascertain whether or not they're good people worthy of consideration as heirs. I'm Ashley. I live here in Las Vegas. I spend most of my time practicing magic, and I am single. What else do you want to know? I've been performing my magic act here since the last time it was renovated. Huh. Never heard of the place before that. I like it here. I like Mr. Davenport, too. He's very hands-off. I appreciate the fact that he doesn't try to give me input about my show. I'm not great at dating. It's probably because I really don't enjoy getting to know people. That's why I think that dinner and a movie is the perfect first date. You have just enough time to exchange facts about each other, and then the food comes and you can't talk because your mouth is full. Then you go sit in a dark movie theater, where talking is frowned on, and you watch a movie. It's great. 
especially if you're with one of those people who insists on talking all the time. I'm great at breakups, though. Yeah, not very good at dating. I've tried dating apps, but I haven't found any that I really like. There are people who talk all the time, even when they have nothing to say. If you have nothing to say besides hello or hi, why talk? I really don't enjoy misguided politeness. It's like when someone tries to do something nice, but it has the opposite effect. Like, like you're walking towards a door and you're too far away, but someone decides to hold it open for you anyway. So then you have to rush to get through the door so they don't awkwardly stand there holding it. Do you know what's easier than rushing through a parking lot to get through a door? Opening it yourself when you're there. When you're part of a magic show, you spend countless hours practicing. We only perform four nights a week, so it would seem like it's an easy schedule, but we spend maybe another 30 hours practicing more if you're bringing someone new into the show. It's a lot. I don't particularly like any of the dating apps out there right now. They're all designed to let you chat with the person before you meet them. If you chat with the person before you meet them, then you find out how horrible they are and you don't want to meet them. Then you don't even get the social rewards of having gone on a date. You know what I want? I want a dating app where you don't ever have to go on a date, where when you match with a likely candidate, the app takes the photos that you've each submitted and places them in a likely dating scenario. Then it returns the photo to you. You can put that photo on your social media platforms and it looks like you've been on a date and you've never had to go on a date. Everybody wins. The problem most people make when they're breaking up with someone is that they try to be too nice. And that's very selfish. Not the good kind of selfishness either. When you're too nice with someone and you're breaking up with them, it makes them sad. It makes them wish that you weren't leaving. It makes them think that maybe they should stay with you. When you're breaking up with someone, it is the one time of your life that you should be a complete asshole so that they actually feel relieved. They feel like a burden has been lifted. Yeah, you should always be an asshole when you're breaking up with someone. That's why I'm very good at it. Everyone talks about selfishness like it's some sort of sin. Selfishness is necessary. Everyone wants good paying jobs. We want them to be in our country and not another country. That's selfish. Everyone wants those good paying jobs to be in our city, not another city. That's selfish. I want those good paying jobs to be mine, not someone else's. That's selfish. Selfishness is necessary for us to survive. I haven't really talked to him that much. We talked a little bit when this place was being renovated. My magic act was becoming popular and I was looking for a place to take up residency and he was looking for an act to host in his arena. It worked out great. We've really only spoken a few times since then usually about business. I guess you could say he's one of my best friends. I don't like interacting with people unless there's a purpose. I would say I'm a people person, but I grow weary of them quickly if they overstay their welcome or talk. I prefer quiet types who show who they are by their actions. You know, a lot of people will have shallow, fake friends who will tell you all about their day, but they'll never lift a finger if you need to move or get rid of a body. I really don't like people like that. A 
I've never had to get rid of a body. But if I did, I wouldn't be stupid about it. You know, everybody just tries to bury the body or throw it in a river with something heavy on it, trying to keep the cops from finding it. The cops are going to find the body. But if I was going to get rid of the body, I would throw it in the river with a bungee cord harness attached to it, and then I wouldn't attach the other end to anything. So when the cops found the body, as they're going to, they wouldn't assume it was murder. They would just assume it was someone stupid who deserved to die. I mean, people win Darwin Awards every day. Why not take advantage of it? You've never heard of the Darwin Awards? They're my favorite. They're named for Charles Darwin, based around his survival of the fittest and genetics and stuff. So, whenever someone dies doing something that is so stupid, they do the human race a favor by draining themselves out of the gene pool, they get a Darwin Award. I used to love watching them on the internet, but now, now really it's just fails. They aren't legitimate Darwin Awards. So I watch a lot of roller coaster disasters instead. They're great too. Oh, it's understandable if you didn't know that I had my own magic act. I'm not on any of the posters. I used to be, but I learned early on that audiences expect a magician to be male. Hmm. So I hired a male presenting actor as the magician. I started working as the assistant, but ticket sales, foomp, shot way up. Oh, we promote it like it's his show, but he's essentially worthless. He doesn't do much of anything. I've actually replaced the actor that's played the magician three times. Audiences never noticed. They're fine as long as there's someone on stage who looks like they expect a magician to look. Usually with a goatee. For some reason, a goatee is mandatory. I'm not mad about it. My act has actually gotten a lot easier since I started working as an assistant and not the magician. I'll let you in on a little secret. The assistants are actually the ones who perform all the tricks in a magic act. The magician really is just there so that people have something to keep their eyes on. They're going to watch him, see if they can figure out the trick, see if he's doing anything sneaky. Everyone really just ignores the girls in the shiny outfits. But we're the ones making the tricks work. Now, magic is all about misdirection. The magician is the biggest misdirection of all. You can get away with anything, as long as someone's attention is focused on something else. That's the key to all of magic, half of life. Everyone knows it, nobody cares. Back when I really was an assistant, I worked for a magician, the great Zambini. He based his signature trick on this very thing. See, we were part of a traveling carnival, and our stage was outdoors. At the beginning of the night, the back of the stage, a Zamboni was parked. It was the Zambini. Zamboni. And he would tell the audience that at some point during the evening he was going to make the Zamboni disappear and no one would notice. So about halfway through the evening, we would have this assistant come out that the audience had not yet seen. Her name was Kelly. She was particularly alluring. And the other assistants and I would help her up on top of a platform and we would begin tying her up with scarves. We'd really take our time about it, make it very erotic, and Kelly would wiggle and pout and make these cute little squeaky gerbil noises. While this was happening, Zambini would pull out his keys and drive the Zamboni off stage. Then he'd run back. We would make Kelly disappear in a fairly standard trick, and when it was done, Zambini would be standing where the Zamboni was with his arms outstretched, like he had just accomplished the most amazing feat in the world. And the audience loved it. They would clap like it was the best thing ever. It was grotesquely sexist, but it worked. 
haven't talked to her since we worked together. I'm sure she's doing fine. Supremely attractive people have it very easy. I'm sure she married rich or got kidnapped by human traffickers and sold on the black market. Either way, she's living in a big house with someone else paying all the bills. She's great. When you're starting out in this industry, you will take anything you can get. It was rough. I was on the road for six months. Before that, I was an assistant to a comedy magician. That was even worse. I'd still take that over any normal job. Oh, comedy magicians. Awful. None of it's real magic. It's all just jokes. I don't have any jokes in my act. Well, I have one, but I don't do it every night. I just save it for when I have a heckler. I've tried working normal jobs, but they all have the same problem. You have to deal with annoying people. You're not allowed to hurt them. I worked in a call center once. That wasn't too bad. I mean, you couldn't touch the people to hurt them, but we were given scripts, which I'm sure were designed to emotionally torture whoever we talked to. The sadists that wrote them were really good at their jobs, too. Yeah. Oh, and there was this computer system they had to navigate before they were ever even allowed to connect with us. Did a great job of wearing down their will to live. By the time they got to us, they were hanging on by a thread. Yeah, that was nice. Hmm. Most people are annoying. Some people take it to a whole new level. Some people are professional at it. Like those, those people who work in lotion kiosks at the mall. They know their product isn't any good. If it were any good, they would sell it in a store. But no, they're at a kiosk, harassing people who walk past until someone is so guilty that they can't just ignore them, and they stop. And then the lotion people start putting lotion on this poor chump. And it's awkward. And the person can't get away. And they massage them. And it's awkward. And the person can't get away. Until this poor, poor slob buys something that is unnecessary and overpriced just to make it stop. Whenever I see those people, and they've got someone in their clutches, I just walk up and I say, it puts the lotion on its skin or else it gets the hose again. I never seem to know how to respond to that. The fact that hecklers are still a thing is proof that society is a failure. I don't know why we still allow them to exist. I have a good way of dealing with them, though. Whenever we get a heckler that's too bad, I mean, it's really bad. I motion to the other assistants and they notify the magician. And they invite the heckler up on stage to help us with our next act. So I bring out a specially made tall box and the magician announces that he is going to make the heckler disappear. We put them in the box. We wrap the box up with chains and we wheel it off stage. The audience loves it. They laugh, they clap, the heckler's never heard from again. <laughs> Works great. And then backstage, I feed the heckler to my alligators. I don't, I don't. I don't have alligators. Box only opens one way. I push it up against an exit door and when the heckler opens it, they can only leave. I've gotten exactly two negative Yelp reviews worth it. No one ever uses real magic in their magic act. It's all parlor tricks and very bendy assistants who can fit into small spaces. Machinery. Audiences just like to pretend it's real. If anybody ever came out and started performing sorcery or blood magic, the audience would lose their minds. I 
to be nice. Every aspect of our society has failed. Look at politics. We live in a democracy that is so divided, no matter who gets elected, half of the population is going to be miserable and angry. Families are divided. Lifelong friendships are torn apart. We are so at odds right now that left and right twicks don't even come in the same package anymore. You can buy anything if you know where to look. I used to buy weed on the dark web before it was legal. I know there are people who buy fake IDs on the internet. Anything. You can find it. They say human trafficking is a $150 billion a year industry, and I want to know how they know that. Are human traffickers reporting income tax, or are they just making up numbers? Oh, I never had a fake ID. I grew up in a small town. It would have been pointless. Everybody knew everybody else anyway. And really, the only reason to have a fake ID is so that you can buy beer before you're old enough. And I don't drink. I did buy a lot of beer for other kids when I was in high school, though. I mean, sort of. I would buy the non-alcoholic beer, and then I would peel the labels off, and I printed my own, put something, you know, generic and fancy sounding. And then, you know, during study hall, I would just sell it at a drastic markup. Nobody ever called me out on it. I don't think they ever figured it out. I even remember hearing some of the kids brag about how much beer they were able to consume. <laughs> oh, they must have been very shocked when they attended their first college party. Oh, I know weed is legal now, but back before it was, everybody would smoke it anyway. You know, it's just one of those crimes you never got in trouble for. Like speeding or practicing medicine without a license. The sale of human organs is a multi-billion dollar a year industry. And who do you think is taking those organs out of the people who lose them and putting them into the people who need them? I doubt it's someone practicing with a license. But I, I'm not, I mean, I'm not doing it. I am not involved in that industry. I dabble in taxidermy, but I am not skilled enough to take a kidney out of someone and put it in someone else and have one of them live. Taxidermy is a hobby of mine. Whenever I find a dead animal, I take it home and I stuff it. And then I save them, and when I have enough of them collected, I take them to dying children in the children's hospital because children love stuffed animals. I think everyone should have hobbies. I like taxidermy and sensory deprivation. I made my own sensory deprivation tank once. I like to lie in it and be alone with my thought. It's very peaceful in there. I slept in it once. It's like sleeping in a coffin. I like to visit kids in the cancer ward. Yeah, I ask them to draw me a picture, and then I trade them for one of the stuffed animals. It makes them feel better to barter. No one wants to be pitied, just given stuff, even kids dying of cancer. I save all the pictures they give me. They say that a piece of art at least doubles in value once the artist dies, and I'm sure their parents will pay top dollar in about a decade. People don't barter enough these days. They don't haggle enough either. For instance, if someone has a poster for a lost pet and they offer a hundred dollar reward, now in my experience, most people would just take the hundred dollars and be happy. I try to haggle a little. 
they'll go for at least 150. I mean, no one posts their best offer on a flyer that's going on a telephone pole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I return lost pets to their owners as a side hustle. See, whenever I see a flyer that has a reward offered and a phone number, I take it down. And then I post the flyer with my phone number and I offer half the reward. Then someone else finds the pet, returns it to me. Then I do a nice little markup, call the original phone number, and reunite the pet with its parent for profit. Does very well. Have you ever tried sleeping in a coffin? It's relaxing. It's cozy. There's extra layers of noise insulation in case you have loud neighbors. I slept in one back when I had college roommates. Oh, I didn't actually go to college, but I lived in student housing after high school. See, you don't actually have to be a student to live there. I hated having roommates, but it's all I could afford. I bought my own place as soon as I could, but they kicked me out. High school is awful. I mean, you undergo years of traumatic experiences, and then when you finally escape, they invite you back for a reunion so that you can go spend more time with the same people who made your childhood traumatic. I don't understand it. Do survivors of other traumatic experiences have reunions? I mean, do people who lived through a plane crash get together and reminisce about the turbulence they experienced before it all went pear-shaped? I don't understand reunions or nostalgia in general. People cling to the past like it was the best part of their lives. But do you know what most people spent most of the past doing? Waiting for the future to come so their miserable lives would improve. Really makes no sense to me. I don't live in the past. I look to the future. I am so ready to be in the future. The second my contract is up, I am out of here. I am retiring to someplace very far away with very few people, and I am never going to think about Las Vegas again. Can't wait for that. Yeah, I want to see what the future holds, because I'm done here. <laughs>